and he's constructing in his head a sort of model of what's going on and then he of course has sort of psychotic breaks as well and he he works his way through that and he creates his own sort of knowledge himself and his own perspective himself and so all of his words are in some sense his experience his experience of other people and himself delivered to you as sort of saying i think these shapes these categories these ideas are actually very very useful for describing parts of the human mind introvert and extrovert is a great one for example okay guys welcome to another exciting podcast this one's basically going to be a i guess you could call it a crash course on carl jung psychology and this is in a lot of ways this is kind of the heart of what this channel is about because we go into like left brain versus right brain, collective unconscious, archetypes, the red book when Carl Jung actually had a very, I think it was about a 10 year psychosis where he, based, where he came across a lot of these concepts that a lot of people use today. Uh, even extrovert, introvert are two concepts that Carl Jung coined that pretty much the whole world uses, you know. Uber Boyo, man, he's like, because the thing about Carl Jung, I love the guy and he's like an, a pioneer in many ways but he's also very difficult to understand, not just because he was a Swiss, but because he's just his writing was very dry. Where Steph, or AKA Uber Boyo, has a very unique way of expressing his ideas, but in a very grounded way. So I think you guys are really, really gonna enjoy this. So please support him, go to his channel, subscribe, tell him that your mate Tom sent you. Send him some love, and if you want to support this show, of course, you can get some merch, join our Patreon group. Yeah, that's pretty much it. You can check, actually, no, go to SoundCloud as well. Might as well just sneakily throw that in there. But yeah, that's it, guys. I've got all the timestamps are in the description box below, so you can skip to whatever topic you want. Actually, at the end, we went into like the shadow side, and shadow integration, also a very, very important topic, but we went into the shadow side of veganism and meat eating and as far as I'm concerned I don't think anyone on YouTube has taken this angle at least when talking about veganism versus meat eating and it's a very very interesting and it's gonna blow your mind and if you really want to support this podcast as well you can go on Spotify and iTunes leave a five-star review uh, it really helps us out because um, you know how YouTube is getting more and more difficult and they're censoring more and more and I've had a lot of issues this year which I haven't really addressed on this channel uh, at least not on video and yeah it just helps a lot and I think that censorship is just gonna get worse as time progresses and I'm just gonna get more controversial so yeah it's just the way it goes right truth has a price but oh well anyways enjoy catch you later Boom. Alrighty guys, welcome to another epic podcast. Uh, we've got Uber Boyo here. What, what's the story behind that name, actually, just before we... Before we uh, <laughs> people are always asking me, do you, do you understand? It's like, it's like uh, I always say, it's like uh, when you're on a date with a girl. You never want to make like explicitly just be like, yeah, this is why I'm here. Like, it's always about mystery. It's about hiding what people know. I can't tell you what Uber Boyo means. That's a secret. That's, that's, that's definitely not what's going on. And if, if you, I guess if you, want, if you want a little bit of a serious, if you go to Cork, like it's just, it's just a very common phrase. People are like, oh yeah, Boyo. How's the crack, Boyo? What's going on, Boyo? And uh, I have, uh, I have, I've bastardized that name. I've, I've nobilized that name into something supreme and, and glorious. So that's, that's all I'll say. Uh, uh, that's what I love to hear, man. <laughs> awesome. Well, what's like, what's your story behind the channel anyway? Like, what was the inspiration for doing these videos? I can see you're very like Carl Jung heavy. So yeah, how'd, yeah. how'd you get into? I, I'm kind of. I'm kind of a little bit heartbroken because I'm a big fan of Nietzsche as well, but no one, no one likes Nietzsche on my channel. They all like Carl Jung, and so I'm like, all right, all right. It's, I see, I see who, I see who's the big alpha male here. You, you is mad. Like, you see who you actually love, you mad bastards. Jung um, is king, man. Uh, it well, seems. <laughs> Yeah, young, young, young is crushing it, man. Young's great. he's the dominant kangaroo up up in, up in these parts. Um, so how I got into it, I. Well, you know, I, I, I like Jordan Peterson's a good anchor point, and I'm not here to be like, oh, I hear Jordan Peterson head, let's repeat all his words and all this stuff. But I was um, in college, and I went into college, and it was sort of like, 
a lot of very, very complex academic theory. And I don't know, I don't want to get too bogged down on this stuff. But basically, they're they're in this place where they're they're um, critiquing the, the nature of the last 2000 years. And and they're talking about all the books that came before it and like, you know, the Bible and the Western canon and all that type of stuff. And I kind of came into college and I was there studying how to break down all these things from the last 2000 years that I had never read. You know, you're supposed to sort of have read these things and I had never read them. We, education is a bit of a disaster these days. Mm. And so I got kind of jaded. I was kind of getting a little bit pissed off. I was taking psychedelics around about that time. I was experimenting with stuff. I was, you know, learning the, the, the typical college experience. You're going through a lot of chaos. There's like hedonism. There's lack of control of a lot of things. And meanwhile, I'm there like having this massive, the actual education I'm getting is very, very cynical, deconstruction, critical type of stuff. And so I got jaded and I just kind of dropped out and I said, no, I just want to read these books that they're giving out about from the start. I want to know what the West is. And so I went to Plato, Socrates, and then eventually it was almost like I was climbing up a tree. I started at like Plato and Socrates, the early guys, and I climbed all the way up to Nietzsche and Jung, basically. That was my goal. And so I dropped out and did that myself. And uh, at that point, I found a, a couple of things in Jung that I found very, very interesting. So this, this, it's, it's quite interesting. It goes alongside my psych psychedelic thing. Psychedelics opened my mind to a lot of this stuff, but they scared me. They, they hurt me. They were very damaging. And in order for me to, um, to, to, to establish myself, to, to prove myself to myself, I had to take a very high dose of psychedelics. And then there was this experience for me where I. Uh, it was like my imagination got switched on after you kind of go a bit grayscale in, in school. You know, you go a bit monotonous. You, you lose access to the more crazy artistic mind. And I'm very artistic in that sense. And so psychedelics turn that back on. And then um, th then uh, actually a little bit after that, I got into Nietzsche and Jung proper. And I started to do some of the exercises they would talk about in it. And they that actually started to switch my mind on in the same way. So if I was to explain this, and I'm going to go on a bit of a tirade, if I was to explain this with more lucidity, and um, it was literally like I was living in grayscale, and then psychedelics switched on color mode for you know the way afterwards for about six or seven months, you have that mm, kind of like, like that the color effect. mode is turned on. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And then doing Jung's dream, like it, it glows, it fades away then after a while. And you're like sort of back to normal, which is usually good. Like it's not, you're not like um, out of your mind for ages. And then um, doing Jung and Nietzsche, like for example, Jung, he talks about how to do dream reading. So I go and I open up the dream reading thing and I open up that part of my head and I pay attention to the dreams with some level of seriousness, which is an insane thing to do for most people. And I started to notice that that feeling of color started to come back very naturally it was like the difference between taking steroids that are really effective for like six months and you're like jacked between working out really consistently for like a year and then actually starting to see yourself get jacked and your testosterone levels going up and you're feeling better like the color started to switch on and that's really what started to interest me then is that i was like whoa this stuff actually works man this stuff is legit and i guess phenomenologically it was legit and um I kind of went from there and I started studying all that stuff. And I was just some like, you know, weirdo studying young and people, I would talk to people and uh, I'd be like, you do the collective unconscious. I've heard about this or like uh, all this type of stuff. But then um, Jordan Peterson comes along and popularizes it. And I'm like, yes, finally, we've got, if we've got someone, someone making it real. Cause I, I remember when I, I first came across him, I was sitting in a coffee shop and my friend sent me a, a Joe Rogan video of him. And I was just like, yes, he's saying Nietzsche, he's saying young. I've never heard anyone talk about this stuff. It was just been me and my own. So uh, and then after that, he fades and then I start my channel sort of in the wake of that. And that's that's really where it came from. So I started talking about Ion, one of Young's books, Jordan Peterson, very scared of. And I did it with Jimmy. And that was that was uh, that was pretty much where we went. And now 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 I'm here and I'm still talking about Young. So I guess that's Welcome. that's the brief story of the channel. <laughs> that's awesome. That. Yeah. Carl Jung is definitely he's blew my mind, like just completely changed my my perception of reality on just everything man just archetypes yeah. synchronicities like he, he coins so many yeah. of these terms that a lot of people use that don't even necessarily know who Jung is you know and just for actually for those yeah. listening at home just before we continue who is Carl Jung and why is he so important in psychology and oh spirituality God, well, he's oh oh God! You're gonna get a you're gonna get a, a jarring take here because I don't think he's actually that important. He doesn't have that much prominence. But the, the academic spheres don't take him very very serious. They one of my friends really got into Carl Jung and he went and tried to um get get like a job as a psychologist. 
uh, sorry, to, to get into his, to study like advanced psychology somewhere. Hmm. And he was very, very big on Jung. And he just started talking about Jung to them. And they all just looked at him like almost like sighing, like another, another one, you know, another fucking Jungian and all that. And I, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not, I, like, I think there's something to this. Like the, the there is a, a there's, there's sort of a dark side to Jung and a, and a bright side. And, um, and he, is still relevant though in a way that you said because he's he, he made such an impact that a lot of our words are actually derived from him introvert and extrovert like that's a exactly. crazy when, when when you think about it like that comes from him and so he's actually incredibly relevant in that sense and archetype really really important word comes from him as well these are huge huge ideas that that are all sourced in him and so you kind of ask yourself it's like well, what the hell does he have to do and why does it like why does modern psychology essentially spit at him now jordan peterson has done a great job in popularizing him again but um i think it comes down to the fact that he was an empiricist. I, now, forgive me for getting technical. Some people would be like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? But it's um, it's it's to do with, like, modern science is very much led by study. So I have to, like, slam the papers in front of you and be like, look, here's the data. Here's all the lab test data and here's all the numbers and all this stuff. And and then we derive ideas out of the numbers on the page, okay? And that's that's really, really how it works. And I know it's weird, but but this is the sort of model right now. Whereas Jung was a lot more of a guy who's, who's, who took in, you know, a thousand, two thousand patients in his life and they were all schizophrenic. You know, like they're crazy bastards and they're they're all seeing stuff and they're talking like they're like on drugs and stuff like that. And they're being like, oh, yeah, and I, I felt like Jesus and all this. And, and so he's like he's sitting there and he's listening to them and he's interacting with them and he's constructing in his head a sort of model of what's going on. And then he, of course, has sort of psychotic breaks as well. And he 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 he, he works his way through that and he creates his own sort of knowledge himself and his own perspective himself. And so all of his words are in some sense his experience, his experience of other people and himself delivered to you as sort of saying, I think these shapes, these categories, these ideas are actually very, very useful for describing parts of the human mind. Introvert and extrovert is a great one, for example. Mm. And I recommend you try use them. And this this is brilliant. Like when you actually see what Jung was trying to do, it, it's fantastic. Of course, a lot of things have updated since him. And so there's there's sort of an issue is that people, people see the words as as if it's the 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 ideas whereas Jung was trying to paint sort of categories over the things he was seeing inside the human mind to show you that maybe try look at this stuff this way look at the shadow or something like that this way um but it, it's ultimately about what he went through and and we can kind of move on from that in some sense and use what he said to, to kind of get further but but the thing is is that he doing this did something incredible that you don't see anymore. And he sort of validated the schizophrenic experience. He he validated the psychotic experience. He, he validated the, the crazy experience. And I'll definitely talk about some science behind that um, later. Mm. And and what I mean by that is the 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 problem it seems to have that, that seems to have happened in modern psychology or generally in the West, even in Jung's time, was we've gotten very, very intellectual, abstract, critical, voice in the head, ego, if you want, mm. left brain, as I would say. And it's it's led to this sort of like stiff way of orientating ourselves. We, we, we sort of don't have a, a sort of access to what the ancients would have called the kind of mythic, poetic, dreamlike mind where they, they would um, see things in a lot more colorful way and a lot more um, magic and dancing way and whatnot. And again, we'll, we'll get into all this stuff. But if you want to know what like Jung's value is and maybe why he, he's so resonant even today, I think that's where it actually comes down to. And this is the reason why he's so rejected is because he came up with a way to allow you to believe in the sort of dreaming, colorful imagination, even delusional mind, the fantasy mind, if you will. Whereas most of psychology is actually, think about it, like schizophrenia and all that. They're trying to get that part of your mind out of you so you can be normal. That's really what the thesis is. Oh, you're having, you're seeing things, you're fantasizing, you're having dreams, you're having weird thoughts. That's not good. You can't go to work. Here's some drugs to get that away. You know, and like, it's fair enough. Some people are, have real struggles with that stuff so they can take drugs and all that. But, but in a general sense, it's a... You know, it's if you have a hammer, everything turns into a nail mm. and that's not what you want to do. You want to you want to approach it a lot more like, OK, wait a second. This there could be something to this. And Jung is that guy is like there is something to this. There is something very interesting to this. And um, I think that's why he's so relevant. And I think that's the best way to understand why he matters and then who he is. He was he was a mad. He was a mad uh, Swiss man. And he um, 
I was a very imaginative man, or he was a very creative man, and he uh, hung out with Freud, as you all know, and then he got mad at Freud, and then he he went had a psychosis. World War One happened, so if you can imagine, imagine before coronavirus, he started to like walk around and see everybody as like dead bodies with like all this plastic wrapped around them. For and you're, you're like maybe you're taking psychedelics or something like that, and you're like freaking out, and you're like, what's happening to me? Am I going insane? And then like a year later, it it just all comes true, and you're like, oh my god, what happened? So that's sort of it's very similar to what happened to Young. He saw a load of dead people, a load of blood, and then World War One kicks off, and he's like, I'm not crazy. Yes, finally, it's it's good. Yes, or right, there's something to this. And so um, yeah, I guess that's a as a very very quick rip the plaster off version of Young, the 101, I guess. Beautiful man. Yeah, I, even like you said about how uh. Not all psychology, but a lot of uh, modern culture tried to suppress those "quote unquote" crazy parts of us. And from what yeah. I understand, with the, the the red book, which we'll get into, is that Carl Jung, instead of suppressing the schizophrenic aspects of his psyche, he delved right into it, full force. Yeah. yeah. And that's how, and yeah. is that it, was that was that the book where he discovered about the collective unconscious and all that kind of stuff. <sighs> Yes. Well, yeah. I guess we can get into that. There's there's several ways we can get into this. I guess I, I may as well lay out some of oh, my ideas on this I think, stuff. I so. think, sorry, to, sorry to cut you off. I think just before, let's start off with just archetypes, because that's a that's a term that I think everyone uses, you know what I mean? So yes. let's break down yes, what, what is an archetype and how can we practically use this knowledge? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is more important, yeah, right? Yeah. How, how do we use this? Yeah, well, this this is a hard question. I'm, I might actually I might actually uh, pivot and go into um, the, the Red Book one first because it'll be easier to explain archetypes afterwards. Okay. Um, go for it. Okay. So, the 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 big thesis that I do think is most important to understand is about that idea of the difference between normal consciousness and the other weird fantasy consciousness. And the, the way I always explain this to people is like, bro, when you go to sleep, all right, you're, you turn off, you know, like what happens? It's like black, you know, you turn off and your ego goes away and that blathering head that's saying that you're a piece of shit all the time just goes to sleep. <laughs> it's gone. It vanishes, it goes into the ether. And then you wake up the next day. But between that happening, this weird other part of your head like this like crazy set of goblins, they start producing like dreams. So all this stuff starts to appear in the middle of your mind. And then you wake up the next day. And if you, if you're attentive, you can write them down. But if you're not, you'll forget about them because mm. they're not that big of a deal. They're not going to, you know, they're not, not that much of an effect in your life. But then you kind of pause for a second. It's like, wait a second, <laughs> wait a second. What just happened there? So I went away, but something else started to do stuff inside my head. And this is immediately suggesting that what's going on inside your head is not some unipolar consciousness. Mm. That's not true. It's obviously not true. There is definitely a separate thing, being, energy, power, a machine, if you want, a, a, maybe a different part of your brain. All right. And all these things are incredibly important because what you are, what you are running around, think of Alan Watts, like you run around saying like, oh, I'm this yoke behind my eyes. Well, when that goes away at night, something else in you does something. And the dreams are not actually they're not distortions like they're not they're just not meaningless. They, they actually do have some lo loose relevancy to your life in some sense. So when you start from that position, you start from that principle and foundation, you kind of say to yourself, you're like, oh, dear, <laughs> this is not good. This means that I've got a, essentially like not a voice in my head, but I've got this like, you know, I've got this like a uh, crazy artist in my head or something like that. I've got this weird part of uh, other thing that, that throws fantasies and dreams at me and, and images, really. Mm. Now, if you think about how you um, go about your normal life. It's, it's actually quite similar to that. If you kind of just sit there and you're getting very meditative, you'll notice that there's a sort of like blah, 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 Steph, would you go, oh, you need a coffee, Steph, your leg's itchy, oh, Steph, uh, blah, 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 and it's just chattering away. And that's the kind of thing you focus on. You walk around, you're listening to this, and it's like, yeah, I need to do that to-do list, yeah? Yeah, I need to make that plan. Oh, that person said that to me. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, Tom, Tom's from Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah I used to live there. Yeah, that, that's, that's great. I wonder, does he have any kangaroos? What's going on? But then even in the other part of your head, there, there, all of this stuff is actually kind of like flickering away and you'll, you'll catch yourself when you daydream for example you're sitting on the bus and that thing kind of just goes 
<sighs> okay, I'm not going to talk that much anymore. And then this weird other part comes in and it starts to show you like, you know, I, you know, giant kangaroos taking over the world and all this type of stuff. Like you start to have fantasies, you fantasize. This other part comes in, this imagination comes in. And of course, the, the, the image of the kid sitting in school and he's sitting there and he's looking out the window and teachers like pay attention. And he's like, I just can't. You're so shit. I just can't. And he looks out the window and he starts daydreaming about being a comic book writer. or He's doodling, you know, he's been told do the task. And he starts doodling in the side of the thing. And you think about that kid. That kid is obviously, you know, if you're going to talk about an archetype, like that kid is going to grow up. If you're going to make a movie about this kid, he's going to grow up to be the great comic book writer, the great movie writer. You know, he was the the, the guy who didn't suit school. He was the, the more outside the box thinker and all that type of stuff. And it, you can imagine that it's maybe that part of his brain just has more dominance over him. Mm. You know, that type of, that type of vibe. Um. And this this piece starts to become really, really crazy because if you look at the way memories work, well, that's exactly what happens when you are sitting there and you remember something. Well, what it is, is you're sort of like in normal consciousness, chattering away, chattering away, chattering away. And then Tom says, Steph, your 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 hair looks bad. And then a memory shoots into my mind, like literally a scene, a movie scene shoots in my mind when, you know, all the other kids in school were, were pointing at me when I was a kid being like bad hair guy or something like that. <laughs> or, or, or like or, or I was getting like I was in a go go to, I don't know, a barber shop and someone shaved my head by accident or something like that. So, you know, all this stuff just shoves in and it comes from the same place. It comes from this. It comes in in the same way the dreams do. It comes in it interrupts the ego. It bullies it out of the way. It kind of, kind of jolts in and it's like very, very weird. It's like, where does all this stuff come from? What's going on? And so this stuff seems to be coming from another part of your head. Young might call it the unconscious. People don't like that word anymore. They call it the subconscious. Th that's fine as well. It, there's, there's a lot of different ways you could categorize this, but it doesn't really matter. What matters the most is that you sort of understand that you're not this one thing. D def obviously, if you just think about what I'm saying, you're just not. You've got other parts to yourself. Now, how far this stuff goes is where the question becomes really interesting, because if you're going to do Freud or Jung, like a very, very simple thing for you to do is actually to just sit there and let those memories come up, let those dreams come up and actually just spend some time understanding what's in the back of the mind. You know, mm -hmm. this stuff is sort of running you in some sense. Like it's it's like all these hidden feelings and emotions they talk about like repression and all this type of stuff and when you take psychedelics for example you're, you're running a dangerous game where you're going to open yourself up to these things coming up and it will like, if if you're not ready to process them it could be quite intense like say for example you were abused as a kid like that could be a very very interesting thing people often take mdma because it's really good for post-traumatic stress disorder why because it makes you feel really really good about everything and then you remember that time you're in a war and you shot a load of people and you think you're a demon and you actually mm. can kind of have compassion for yourself. And it has this cleansing feeling to it. But of course, you never would have faced that in normal life, because if you were to remember yourself killing people in normal life, you would have a panic attack in the middle of uh, the thing. So you try to bully it away. You maybe might even take some suppressive drugs to help you do that. But of course, it's never going to leave you. It's like you're haunted. It's like inside that place where the dreams come from and the fantasies come from. There's like a big, scary energy, a big negative charge from what you did. And you're, you're really you're having trouble with that. And so you it, like you're never really going to solve this problem until you call it up. And who knows if, if you even can. You call it up and you face it and you digest it. Oftentimes, people with PTSD, you've heard Jordan Peterson talk about this. They, they need to... Um, actually develop a new philosophy for the nature of the world because mm. they themselves became the the users of violence. And that's um, an extremely difficult thing for most people who have a philosophy where hurting people is wrong. It's like, well, sometimes soldiers have to hurt people to make sure that society's safe. And it's like, what do you say to the soldiers? Mm. You're bad. It's like, that's not fair. This type of thing. So, so again, you, you can see what's going on. All this stuff would be somewhere else and hidden away from these guys so they can be normal. But these guys aren't normal. And, and that, that experience is not normal. And it needs to be dealt with. You take psychedelics, it comes up. You, you, do, you access your memories, it comes up. You take MDMA, it comes up. And it, it's, all, it's all like that. And so all, all of this kind of wraps into this generalized idea. Now, when you look at extreme forms of consciousness or even you could say extreme problems like depression, like real depression, real chronic depression mm. or schizophrenia, you know, these are very, 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 very difficult things because depression is sort of like there's this there's this maybe black, heavy cloud living inside you. And every time you try to 
get excited about something, it just sucks all your energy out of you, you know, and it's it's living in this dream world. And so all your dreams are, are, are pessimistic and negative. And it's like it's holding you down in some sense. Yeah, I, I and you don't know what's going yeah. on. I definitely uh, relate to that because I've been through such a depressive person where even now I can't even relate to the person I used to be. But at that stage, you're just like, yeah. trapped. It's a prison. It's completely, you know mm. what I mean? And you, you identify with all these thoughts and feelings and it's fucking crazy, man. And the thing about even though, you know, I watched The Joker, have you seen the movie? Uh, yeah, I have. Yeah, yes, yeah. How he says like right. the worst thing about mental illness is that people expect you to behave like you don't have one, right? The, um, the, and that, perfect. Nailed, nailed it on the head with that one, man. And yeah, so yeah. Sorry to uh, disrupt. No, no, not at all. Completely not at all. relate with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, not at all. And like, it's like it's a good it's a good way to kind of like look at this stuff. So, for example, were you saying? Did you have depression or or what was going on? I was I am depressed. I was at, at this time as well. I was like smoking weed every single day, and this was from complete escapist reasons and getting drunk. And I was hanging out with Bogan, so my very low consciousness. No offense to Bogans, but <laughs> I was hanging out with a very <laughs> low consciousness crowd. So of course, everything that I was listening to, I was watching like fucked up movies and TV shows and horrible music with really disempowering lyrics and just everything, man, everything, you know. And so I, that's, I, I didn't have a Jordan so, Peterson at that time, you know, to help yeah. pull me out. Yeah, that's that's what I find so interesting about this stuff, because it's almost like I like I'm a musician. So I'm I, I kind of get frequency and stuff like that. And I know this is very new agey stuff. And I I am actually very re resistant against this stuff. But I think this this can work. And if you think about it, like, or you've got that normal head, that normal brain, the normal way you're, you're conducting things where there's no problems and you're just trying to fit in and act normal, which yeah, is fair enough. Pretty much. But Survive, then you have also. Yeah like the soldier like the soldier killed someone and he has this extremely problematic charge in the back of his head because he doesn't know what to do about that and no one gives him good answers mm. oh everything is love it's like that's not a good answer no i fucking took someone's life with a bullet that's not love that's severe sometimes and I did actually that, that can I, make you feel even worse like when you're in yeah. such a dark because i've been through the horrifically brutal existential crisis and when people just tell you like oh just be happy oh it's all one oh it's all connected yeah even just the whole all yeah. connected the fact that that's interpreted as a positive thing like it isn't positive or negative but when you really f connect with the collective unconscious and all the not just all the good but all the evil as well you know what i mean that's why when i say we're all one i don't say it with a smile so yeah we're all <laughs> it's all connected yeah. you know yeah it's it's a lot scarier of a of a statement to me now <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's 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 a really. Uh, I actually definitely want to touch on that point because that's that's an excellent thing to talk about. Um, absolutely. So you have this this soldier, and he's like after doing something terrible, and he, it's all this charge, and 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 then people around him, all the normal people, they they seem like they're actually not aware of what reality is and so you feel alone you feel weird and all that mm. and then with something like depression like god knows there, there's depression is like a very very poorly understood thing well it's, it's better than it used to be but one really consistent thing with it for example is uh, there's often some, some type of childhood trauma or usually when there's childhood trauma you're probably going to manifest some type of depression mm -hmm. later childhood trauma can be quite interesting it can be maybe a divorce from your parents or abuse or something like that um so you can imagine the same thing like you're a little kid and your fucking uncle does something really intense to you or your parents break up and suddenly your reality falls apart existential mm -hmm. crisis suddenly everything's not healthy all the normal kids with two ki parents that's you're not one of those and so it all goes into your mind and i was literally talking to a dude yesterday who his mom used to come in and shout at him all the time and um mm. it was so scary for him that he actually learned to sort of just go bottle it up and he said that there was a period in in his life when he was really depressed where he just felt like a robot he felt like he had no emotions he felt empty now that's so so interesting when you think about it because it's like um your normal kid can sort of like feel and you're fine and all that but then all this terror comes the the, the scary mom comes in or the divorce comes in or or with the the soldier like P, uh, the, the bullets come in the, the the danger comes in and you shove all that stuff in the back room it's like i can't have any emotions right now because i'm in a dangerous situation and i need to just be I just need to be calm or something like that. Yeah, God knows why you do it. You shove it all in the back. It goes into the dream world. And then you lock it up. It's like, you can imagine, um, it's like Narnia, you know? Mm -hmm. And you shove it all in the wardrobe and then you just wrap a load of chains around that. And then you walk around your life and you feel empty. And inside that wardrobe is this really heavy, scary, intense energy. Mm -hmm. All that negative feelings that you had.
And so it's it's so weird how this works then, because you're walking around, you have pretty much nothing going on. You're sort of zapped. You're empty. You're you're you're, you're sort of like a, a ghost walking through life. I hear stuff like this quite a lot. But then um, in the back of your mind, there's this like rumbling wardrobe with all this energy inside of it. This energy is heavy. And you were still like that's still a part of you. And so it makes this other part, the normal part of you, attracted to that vibe. And so you notice quite a lot with people who are in uh, depressed, they would they would have specifically what you're talking about. You know, they'd listen to the music that has that level, a lot of dissonant sounds and all that type of stuff. And I, I actually love that stuff. Like, I really get into that. It's really I can really wrap myself up in that feeling, you know, really get lost in heavy, dark thoughts and yeah, all this man. type of stuff. I, I'm a and I, I, too, so I completely understand even now. But yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit careful yeah. of like the lyrics. Of the, there are just some that just goes way too far. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. Th- see, that's it. And then when you listen to stuff like the lyrics and all that, that, that's the kind of thing is that there's a reason why they're there because they're they're, they're heavy, they're dark, they're mm. scary ideas. You know, if the soldier w- w- allowed his post-traumatic stress, he literally allowed that feeling of being a murderer to speak. Imagine the song he'd make. Imagine the background music he'd have. It'd be fucking like it'd be the most metal shit ever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you're like break their bones, take their life. Like it'll be really intense yeah. and all that. And so it's almost like this, this Narnia, this, <clears throat> this box, it, it has a, a sort of like energy inside your head and it's, it's drawing you, it's controlling your life. It's like some type of destiny, you know, it's, it's sitting inside you like this shaking um, thing and you think you, you're, you're, you're fine. You're, you're, you're normal. You're free. You don't, you, you're, this, this isn't affecting you at all. You think, oh, it was just a divorce. Oh, it was just, uh, you know, I was just, my mom just shouted at me. It's not like it really did that big of a deal. You know, I'm just depressed now because life, because, you know, reality, society shit. And so you're there, you're kind of broken and there's this thing vibrating inside of you. And in some sense, you want to talk about an archetype, like this is very common for a lot of people. In some sense, the trick is for you to actually go and take the chains off that door and open it up. But you don't want to do that because what will happen is the feelings will come back. Mm. And that was like, I was literally talking to the dude yesterday and he was sort of saying, and I was asking him, right, all right, so someone walks up to you when you're like 21 and they say to you, how's things with your family? What, uh, what would you say? And I say, oh, well, usually I, I just smile and pretend there's nothing wrong. And yeah, I'm like, fine. yeah, but what would happen if you actually just told them the truth? And then he said, as he was thinking about that, he could feel a welling up in his throat, you know? And he was, it was sort of like interesting. It's like, wait a second. So is this what's, is this what's in Narnia? Is this what's coming up? Are you a little bit hurt still about what went on? And maybe you've developed this way of being that's not like this at all you know it's sort of like normal calm emotionally stable but emotionally stable isn't absent of emotions is not necessarily emotionally stable that's a different thing and so you want to talk about archetypal experiences this could be framed as what Jung was indicating as the shadow experience a lot of us get stung by life a lot of us do bad things a lot of us have bad things happen to us we reject it and stuff it away in the in the wardrobe and in many senses facing the shadow is often what we need to do. We need to kind of go into that stuff, dig back into it and feel it again and get back into it again, you know? Mm. And so it's a way that you could understand this. And I think this is a really, really important foundation to understanding all this stuff. If you want to talk about the Red Book, that's sort of what happened to Jung. Perhaps he had a lot of bullshit in his head that he hadn't worked through. And it was he stuffed it away in his Narnia. And of course, there's there's more to this with Jung because Jung, of course, was very very interested in history and and these big ideas. And that can kind of seem like a dry academic thing, but it's it's also there as well. Mm-hmm. You know, like what's going on in the world in society is not separate from you. It's almost like Narnia. When you first open the door, you have to face your you know your the time you killed that person or the time your mom shouted at you or the time your parents divorced. That's that's the first level. But if you keep going, you come in contact with, you know, uh, the Irish are going to eventually have to come in contact with the, the the inferior complex we feel towards the English, you know. And you might think that that's not a big deal. I think we're over that. But actually, it's still present in our consciousness. And it's it's kind of a bad – it's something that we have to work through. It's, it's not a healthy thing to kind of always frame ourselves, even in our jokes, against the English. You know what I mean? Whoa. Like it's something that kind of goes on there. Sorry, but just you saying that is reminding me of uh, even in Australia, how we were – raised as convicts and of course surely that's going to affect our psyche without yeah. relations to the government and the police and all that kind of stuff 
So yeah, just, yeah, man, that's, that's actually, mind blowing. That's super interesting. Yeah, I man. never thought about that. Yeah, you're all you're a you're a, a nation of bandits and, and all that. Yeah, and, and, and I, I guess what's actually crazy. Sorry, to, uh, something interesting is that we had a vote whether or not we wanted to be dependent or independent from the queen, and most people voted no. We want to keep serving the queen. So people are already kind of like self-regulating in that sense. So I found really interesting. Yeah, it's it's a very very interesting thing, and 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 in some sense, like um, uh, like I always recommend. I know the the Red Book and and Young's really crazy tears. They're really romantic and all that. Yeah, it's good, but you, you don't really you don't really need that stuff till much later. You know, it's it's better mm. if you kind of start with this more personal stuff. That's what he recommended anyway. And okay. um, there will be the odd person, but it's pro it's almost certainly not you. But it will be the odd person who who maybe gets these big ideas immediately and they're just sort of they have to give up their personality to it but just don't you don't want to be that person that's a that's a hard person to be and um, but that's sort of it so you go and you face the shadow you you bring up that 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 intensity and then you you look in and you so you open up the the narnia thing and you bring up all that intensity it's like so you open up the doors of the wardrobe of where the dreams come from and out comes a big monster the time you killed someone, the time the, the shock happened, all this type of stuff. And you're like, ah, oh, and you start weeping and crying. And suddenly you go from being an adult who's hard and normal and you're a weeping child again. Mm. Exactly where it happened, you're a weeping child saying to yourself, I don't know what's happening to me. Why is this all happening to me? What's going on? I'm confused. And that's exactly where you are. Now, a lot of people want this experience. It's the, the feeling of it, it's freeing to kind of get that stuff off. But they use psychedelics in order to open that door and it, it can open. Just bear in mind that if you've got a lot of stuff in there, you're, you're literally saying, I'm going to take drugs so I can face monsters. And it's like, wow, dude, like that's 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 chaos. It couldn't it can work. It really can work. But uh, just know what you're doing. You know, mm. Jung would suggest more naturalistic approaches. Yeah, uh, and, even, and even, right, even right now, I'll completely, like when people ask me, oh, should I do psychedelics? I don't even recommend psychedelics anymore because I've gotten stung. And yes, I recovered and yes, it was a positive experience for me, but it would be irresponsible for me to project my own experience because I know that not everyone yeah. has a happy ending with this kind of stuff. You know what I mean? And, yeah. not, you know, you're not going to, it's going to be much less likely for you to do these practical, sustainable things and not have a psychotic breakdown. You know what I mean? Because psychedelics yeah. are freaking, uh, yeah. like you said, it opens up the door and it's freaking intense, man. It can be really intense. Yeah, and, and that's really the thing to think about. And I think if you have a good grounding in what we could call <laughs> sort of non-linear approaches towards psychology... <laughs> It can it can really help you with something like psychedelics. You can sort of say to yourself, "Oh fuck, this is some dark energy coming up, and maybe I can start drawing it for a while or something like that." And um, and then, as I said, MDMA can be a really really useful thing. Uh, for example, if you know what you're doing, processing emotions. It's these things all do sort of have relevancy, and it's it's something you could sort of consider in your in your toolbox of mental work, whatever your type of doing, whatever you're doing. But but again, the the sort of story is like you you asked about an archetype, and I, I assume that Jung was painting this idea of the shadow to represent this thing. It's like inside the wardrobe that you've chained up, there's a fucking monster and you, you're going to have to face it. If you want to fix yourself, if you want to change your life, you're going to have to face it at some point. You can't escape that. And if you don't, it will do this weird thing where it will tune you into all this heavy energy. It's almost like it's sucking you towards it and has incredible power. And it will change your personality towards that. If you want to change yourself, go towards that thing. And then what he says, in his opinion, and what he experienced, because he faced his own shadow, he opened his narnia, he felt that it all hit him, right? And then behind that, you go actually like, oh, so the clouds come out, the monster comes out, you feel like a child, and then psh, the story ends. You you overcome the shadow, or you integrate the shadow a little bit, or something like that. Mm. And then like you know, the the, the music dies down, the the, the dust settles. And you're just sitting there and all the energy is gone. The shadow's gone. You finally accepted. I, I took someone's life. Life is a very, very tragic place. I finally accepted. Um, I, I'm, I was scared. That's what was wrong. I was actually scared. I was scared of my mom. That's what it was. And then you, everything goes quiet. And you look at the, the, the wardrobe and you see that, okay, it wasn't just a wardrobe. There's actually like a door behind it. And there's this like imaginative world, Narnia, you know. Mm. And maybe that imaginative world, that place you can go where the dreams come from like maybe you maybe you can actually go and actually interact with it like build a relationship with it you know you go into that magic world and think of it this way like you you look at a film made by an artist and a film is almost like a super a big dream 
Mm. You know, the artist sits there and he doesn't the artist doesn't come and be like this film is going to make you feel sad and happy so that you um have a good experience and you come out of it. like they just come in and they give you this very vivid crazy story unexplained with all these like colors and pictures and sounds and it makes you feel all these big emotions and then you come out of it and you're kind of like scratching your fucking noggin being like what the hell just happened there why was that so good you watch harry potter you're like how is that such a captivating story you watch lord of the rings it's like how is that so captivating mm. what's going on it's almost like this part of your mind, the dream mind, the fantasy mind, the mind that we have denied, the mind where we store all our bad memories, this part of your mind is the vivid thing that fills your life with energy and meaning and life. And it animates your life. It adds color to your life. And maybe this is what Jung was trying to talk about when he talks about the quote unquote, the anima, you know, when he talks about that archetype, right? He's sort of suggesting that in this, uh, behind the shadow, inside the little box, there is the magic world. And you actually are a magician as well. You are like little Harry Potter. You're not a mogul. You're actually someone who, if you go in and you you learn what this part of your head is, you can create dreams too. You can move people through too. And again, a very, very practical sense, you know, any writer should definitely take this stuff somewhat serious. Explore it in some way mm. and try to go into this part of their head. A lot of writers talk to me and they're like, tell me which how to make a hero's journey story. I'm like, no, that's def you're doing it wrong, man. No. How, how do I wish archetypes to appointment? No, you're doing it wrong, buddy. You want to get into the part of your mind that produces archetypes. You want to get into the part of your mind that produces all this crap. You don't want to that you don't want to have an abstract technical experience of this. You don't want to you're not going to read a listicle that's going to make you a good writer. You want to get into the part of your head that has created Shakespeare, that's created Goethe, that's created um, Hollywood films, that's created all that. stuff. That's the place where you want to go. That's the thing that will generate new stuff, even in terms of just being a social person with a personality. Like you'll notice that one of the most captivating things to be around is someone with a sharp imagination and wit. They're the, usually the funny people that they're they're very free and they can talk free. And, and there's this part of your mind that can do this. You can kind of be, be if you're a salesman, you know, and you paint a colorful picture that's very emotionally charged because you're in access with this dream mind, as opposed to the salesmen you often hear who literally sound like robots because they're reading off a script. Yeah. And, and, and there's, there, there's, like, there's a huge thing you have to understand there that, that this is the part of yourself that makes you original, that makes you a person, that makes you alive, that animates you. And so perhaps that's what young men put the anima. It's a very, very interesting idea. Mm. And then the, the, the last archetype he proposes, and we'll talk about maybe archetypes in another way, is um, that, you know, the, the, the owner of Narnia, the king of Narnia is this thing called the self. It's almost like big God or something like that. But maybe we can talk about that a bit later. But, but as, as long as you see that pattern, that's quite important. And what seems to have happened with Jung is with the Red Book, he had all this anxiety about being, you know, cool scientists. Pe people were people are going to call me a quack. People are going to call me a weirdo. Right. And that that's actually quite a traumatic thing because he's dedicating his whole life to be, you know, respectable. Yeah, of course. And he's like, oh, but people, if I tell them what I actually think, like people are going to think I'm a fucking insane bastard. <laughs> and he, kind of, he, sho he shoves what he actually thinks. Mm -hmm. He shoves what he actually thinks. He shoves his experience into Narnia. Oh, I'll, I'll just make everything scientific. I'll make everything appeal to science. I'll, the, 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 whole, the whole archetypes and dreams. Not, uh, maybe I'll just kind of push that in there. And he shoves it into the back of his head. And he does this perhaps his whole life mm -hmm. to impress Freud, his fake daddy or something like that. And he shoves it all back in and then it starts to build up charge. And then one day there's too much in there and it starts to shake and it starts to open. And in Jung sitting there and in the middle of the day, he just hears a voice in his head. And in the middle of the day, a fantasy rushes over him and takes his body over and he's seeing blood everywhere. And it looks like that not only did the shadow come out, but like the fucking whole Narnia just came out as well. And he's seeing like he's seeing like he's sort of feeling like the 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 kind of collective mood of war coming over him maybe a year before the war happened and all this type of stuff. And you can understand perhaps what was going on with the Red Book then is that it was like Narnia burst open because he stuffed too much stuff in it. Or maybe there was so much intensity in the air because you can kind of feel I think you can feel that intensity right now. Like things I, two years ago. There was a sort of feeling of like even around about the Trump um, election, there was this sort of feeling of 
it was very funny. It was almost like a TV show, you know. It was like, uh, who's who's going to win? Is it going to be the left or the right? And mm. everybody was like really snarky with each other. And there was like loads of memes. And it was this kind of like funny thing where people were like joking and making fun. It's like, oh my god, like Trump's literally a reality TV show. Right. We, we live in a joke. And then everybody on Trump's side was like just, you know, making all these really funny memes, like making fun of Hillary. And it was this like laughs all around. And it, it, it seemed like there was no consequence. But now, now there's like there's a very heavy energy. Like now it feels like whatever's going on in the world right now is like we're moving into oh, we're moving yeah. out of stability and we're moving into absolute chaos. Like there's this feeling that there's going to be wars, there's going to be pandemics, there's going to be like a totalitarian police states, there's going to be mass deaths. Like there's all this feeling and you can you can literally I can feel it in the air. I think everybody can feel can it feel in the, the air. Tension. It's not the same. 100%. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so you can imagine someone like Young, like he's mm. God, like he's just very sensitive to that his narnia is really really attached to that and so it burst out and it, it took him over and he has he has a lot of questions to ask about this now again you ask to be practical so the reason why i'm presenting all this personal stuff is because for most people that's all you need to do but for carol he got a feeling of the the collective the big stuff the skin it's, it's not good stuff like he was he was he thought he was going insane man he was having visions in the middle of the day of people dying that's that's oh. like that's what people di get diagnosed with schizophrenia that's if you told someone if young told a psychiatrist nowadays he'd probably get he probably get drugged, you know, yeah. and that's kind of like, what does that mean? And so Jung comes with this idea of like, maybe there's more to this stuff than we think, mm. you know, maybe the schizophrenics delusions are not actually out, as out of touch as you think. Now, look, huge disclaimer here. A lot of people have schizophrenia. It, it, it is a really debilitating thing. And, and this idea of... You know, like what you're seeing is real. It's, it's definitely not true. There can be like malfunctions and everything. It's important to keep in mind. But the part of our mind that generates dreams is attached to that part of our mind that makes someone schizophrenic. Mm. And and you can't separate them out. And it's a very, very scary and difficult idea. And then something like psychedelics, well, they, they stimulate that part of your head as well. They open that part of your head as well. And And you've got all these questions about this. Like, what do you do about this? How serious do you take this? Where do you go with this? You know? Um. So I guess that's a sort of general story I'd like to tell. We can definitely talk about archetypes and stuff now if you wish. Uh, they're the, the three big Jungian archetypes, the shadow, the anima, the self. Um, but, but archetypes can mean a lot more if you want to talk about right. that stuff. Like like magician, lover, king. Like yeah. These, these sort yeah, of yeah, yeah. popular archetypes. Yeah, we'll go actually yeah. go into that. Because as well, like you're talking about like when people should face their shadow, right? And it's about feeling your emotion, letting it come up. But how do you sustainably go towards this like do you just journal do you like yeah like, yeah, yeah. That, that, I, that's pretty much it well yeah I, I, it, it is journal, it is actually it. simpler than you <laughs> it is actually yeah. simpler than you think it is much simpler than you think but it is um th there's a kind of a, a technique to it because I haven't talked about this much, but I'm big on the left brain and the right brain. I think Jung noticed all this stuff very empirically, as I said at the start, and, and painted all these pictures for us. Mm -hmm. But he didn't have any neuroscience to back him up. And so he's seen as a quack. And um, th look, fair enough. You like Critique him all you want. I think, I think Jung takes the pressure. I think destroy him. I think it, like there's a lot of things that are are very very up there that that you don't have to take you don't have to join the young cult and be like synchronicity all the time you don't have to mm -hmm. you know he's got some good stuff that actually works listen to Jordan Peterson Jordan Peterson is a very very well founded man in the science and he appreciates certain parts of young he does not talk too much about synchronicity he does not talk about some of the wacky things because he knows that it's not stable um but with young like modern neuroscience has actually backed up certain ideas. This thing I'm talking about, the fantasy mind mm -hmm. and uh, the normal mind, like it's very, very, very complex. But in a simple sense, it does seem to be very close to this idea of we have a split hemisphere. And I know you're kind of like, is that that meme about like logical left brain and artistic right brain? And it's actually, yes, it is that meme. Now, it's a bit more complex than that. I recommend people look up Ian McGilchrist. But basically, your your, your left brain is almost like the doer, the day-to-day -day normal doer, the guy who 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 puts things together, you know, who, who organizes lists. Mm -hmm. He's the sort of practical accountant. He's like the secretary of your mind. That's actually the best way to think about it. And And this is the thing that you let lead your head. And this is the voice in your head as well. 
That's that's the really weird thing. This is your your Broca's area usually is on your your left. That's your voice, your inner voice. It's the one that talks. When people get their left brain damaged, I think that's what it is. Yeah, when they get their left brain damaged, they can't they can't make out words. People move from talking in meaning to it's just sounds. The right brain is like the artist, so it appreciates the sound. So language turns from like this to like it's like almost like the part of your mind that can detect accents and intonation yeah. is turned on, but the other part that can detect meaning isn't. So make, that that says a lot. And then obviously the voice inside your head, but you notice that. Like you talk to someone with anxiety, one of the main things they want you to do for them is to help them turn off the voice in their head, help them stop the voice in their head hurting them. And this is what you start to realize. There's an, there's an, as, as Jung said, there's another part of your mind. Narnia might be letting you have access to this right brain. This right brain doesn't necessarily have a voice, like we, how we understand it anyway. It's not the part talking. It's an other part of your head. There's there's so many weird things where um, when people get brain injuries and they're walking around and they um, they they get a brain injury and they I, th- I think they cut they cut the middle. So you've got this thing in the middle that links the two. You cut the middle, the corpus callosum. Yeah. And what will happen is when you, when you get up in the morning and to get dressed and you reach out with your 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 hand, your right hand, uh, you know, one half of your brain reaches out and grabs some clothes. The other hand will come and take it off and put it down and get another one. Yeah, man, oh, man. yeah, man. And then another. Yeah, Holy yeah, shit. yeah. That's. That's legit what happens. And then there's uh, there's other instances where you, you know, you're going to pick up a snack bar or some food and you go over and you pick up like a snack bar. And then the other hand comes and says, get away, you know, <laughs> and and you have to really think about that, like really think about that. It's like there's two in, like consciousnesses inside of you. That's the weirdest shit ever, man. And this is fucking studied. This is studied. This is not young, just sort of studying his fancies. This is young. This is actual science now. Right. This is actual studies. So there's these two forces going on. It's weird as shit. It's Whoa. really weird. The duality of. Men, yeah, man. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, man. Absolutely. And there's um, a lot of really weird stuff about this. Like, for example, the left brain is actually a liar. So the, the normal you is has this habit of being delusional and rationalizing and making up stories. So the the the, the right brain can reach out and pick up a, a, an, a, an object, an orange and put it in the left brain's hand. And then the person who's studying can say, how did that get there? And the left brain will make up a story. Oh, well, I was really hungry, which is completely not true. The reason why it's there is because the other part of your head put it in. But the left brain is in denial of this. It doesn't. Be- this is the most important. It doesn't believe that there is a right brain, whereas the right brain knows there's a left brain. It's so strange Whoa. when you look into it. Yes, it's really That's weird. Crazy. So you, yeah. the... No- Yes, man, it really is. It really is. I haven't thought about it, it really that way before. Is. That one's aware of the other side, but the left isn't. But maybe it has to yeah, be that man, way. It's... It has to be all data, all rigid, and you know, just to get your day yes, to day, true. like you said. So, I guess in a weird, yes, in a weird way, it makes sense. But it's also like, pff, whoa, holy yeah. shit, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and to, to stay on point about the practicality, like there's a reason why I'm telling you this. So first of all, Jung noticed all this stuff empirically. Now there's this stuff, science coming out, and yeah. you adapt Jung to this. So follow the evidence, and you start to see that it's like, oh my god, this this guy was not wrong about this stuff. There is literally one part of your brain, the ego, the left brain, that is in denial that there exists another consciousness, but that other consciousness knows. That this is going on and it under it's wise it understands it needs to let the left brain do its thing and but it also is kind of like this other place that you can go to like narnia well, yeah. you know it's there it's literally we can see it now in cat scans and shit and you're you're kind of like you're scratching your noggin being like what the hell does that mean most people look at this stuff they can't interpret it because we're we're still stuck in that left brain science studies thing we can't we can't we can't even make sense of what this means whereas of course Jung gives us a lot of tools to understand it so maybe maybe this is just a hypothesis on my part but i've seen it work with people and and this is very similar to how psychotherapy is done maybe if you can teach the two brains to talk to the two hemispheres to talk to each other you can start a dialogue you know and that would be you sit down and you journal, but not journal in the sort of typical way. You want to actually kind of try journal in a right-brained way. You want to try bring your memories up in a more romantic way, in a more how you experience them. What was the feelings like? All that stuff you want to bring up. You don't want to journal and be like, oh, I had a divorce. It was really bad. Uh, no one liked me. Anyway, I went right. to school. Like that's very 
bullet point to the to the thing. You're not really getting into anything there. So whereas give, if you give, go into give a more an example of this, so when you're journaling, you want this stuff to come up. Are you like consciously like, oh, you know what? I want to bring up this from my childhood, or, or is it just oh, you just look at a blank page and whatever comes up, and then you start from there. So right? that's that's that's. That's, that's not a really good question. It's another really good question. It's really, really hard to make sense of this. And um, your your left brain is linear. And so when we talk about time and memories, the way that it processes things is serial, linear. It goes uh, chronological. Yeah. So I was born and then I went five and then I was 10, 15. And then that's when the divorce happened. Very, very bad. 20, went to college, blah, blah, blah. Now here I am now. Straight line. Yeah. And that's how it thinks. OK, now the right brain is quantum, if you want. And um, it's associated. Think of how think of how things work. You know, like, think, sorry, think of how cr- uh, you smoke weed. What happens is you're like, oh, my God, microphone, um, rock star, um, Jesus Christ, superstar, uh, nature of the universe. And it's like really, really radical, crazy associations. That's my right. Brain, Whereas if I'm. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So you probably you're probably really in touch with this. So I I would look at microphone and be like microphone button, turn it on, cost me this much money, procedural <laughs> thing, left brain talking, you know, <laughs> linear. Why am I here? Why am I talking about a microphone? What's going on? Um, and so the, these two these two modes are very, very important because if you sit down with yourself right now and you notice the feeling that you have, maybe you have a, a very, very subtle um, sadness inside of you, an apathy or a sadness or something like that, and you kind of sit with that feeling and you kind of just kind of let the associations flow, it will kind of start to bring you places. Hmm. You'll bring this association and you'll remember this is what I felt like when I was 21 and depressed after college. And during that time when I was depressed, I was really angry at my dad. Hmm. And that reminds me of the time my dad was punched me because I was laughing at him, which reminds me of when I was in school because that's when it started to go wrong. And you see him kind of like just floating around in a weird thing Mm. and it's it's the interesting thing like through this moment every object can be an infinity you have access to incredible vistas of 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 yourself Mm. right right here right now and this is perhaps the the most it's kind of a weird way to do it and people kind of get annoyed about this stuff but it is it is a way that you can think about it in a practical sense like you can actually just sit there with the blank page and and turn on get into this part of your head you know, this is this is really the key. It's about getting into this part of your head. Like, this is what I do with people when I'm coaching them. I get them into this part of their head because mm. that's usually what's going on. This is like a, a supreme processor, whereas your left brain can't process stuff that well. If you murdered someone in cold blood in a war, your left brain can't process that because your left brain has some premises of what is good and evil. Yeah. And you're in violation of them all. And what the right brain does is it gives you perspective. It gives you a reframe. It, it makes you understand. It allows you to feel in a different way. Every memory is a reframe is another thing as well. Mm. Um, and so this is what often people need. They need to get out of the, the, the frozen conception of themselves and go and allow that to, allow, as you said, allow that a, a collapse to happen, the existential crisis to happen, and, and allow this magic right brain to reanimate it. And then they can kind of get back into their palace mm. again and they're, they're put together in a better way. Yeah, and, um, fe- and feel it, right? I think that's a very big, big important thing because some people just suppress, huge. suppress. And I, I used to be like that. In fact, I'm, I am I consider myself a very artistic, sensitive soul. So I think my early self uh, kind of defended this, especially in Australia, man. Because people are savages, man, here. So you, you can't be sensitive. <laughs> you got to like yeah, feel yeah, the yeah. thick skin. And then obviously my brain overcompensated and I was too harsh. I was too yeah. unempathetic. Uh, when I look back, really, I was still empathetic, but my my ego kind of tricked me into thinking I wasn't. But yeah, it's just all just what you're saying right now. It's all about like really feeling the emotion. It's scary, man. Like you said, opening that fucking Nadia and all yeah. these monsters come out and shit. Like even with psychedelics, you know, it can even go real extreme. Not just collective worldwide events, but it can go to like cosmic level stuff. Yeah. You know, like spirit, yeah. the yeah. spiritual war or whatever you want to call it. So. Fucking crazy, man. Yeah. 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 It's, and it's really important to, to keep that stuff in mind. Yeah. Like you're, you're dealing with you know, it's pretty intense stuff. And, and, and even like a divorce might not seem that relevant, but as a kid, that feels like the end of the world. Like, are you prepared just on the fucking Tuesday morning to feel the end of the world? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because that's sort of what you're asking. You, and this is what's so interesting about it is that like our left brain or whatever, we, we take this approach that our lives are trivial 
And it's like, oh, the divorce is not that big of a deal. It's just a divorce. It's like, ah, oh, bro, no. That felt like the end of the world. Dude, that was my, that felt like, that was my uh, reaction when my parents got divorced when I was like 12. Yeah. I was like, oh, shit. I guess I just didn't know how to process it. But obviously, when you look back, you're like, yeah. of course that was a huge deal. Your whole, like, your whole world is just shattered, fall apart. Yeah. What are you yeah. going to do? Yeah. Yeah, but, absolutely. Yeah, keep absolutely. Going. Sorry to cut you off. No, it's good. It's good, man. It's good. Like that. That's that's precisely it. And you, you kind of need to just chew on it a bit and and kind of let the the feelings go through you. And and in, in some sense, that sense. And I, I like this can become dangerous because it turns into this uh, feminizing thing where it's like, oh, you've got to you got to like just always crumple into a little uh, petal whenever you have a bad emotion. It's like not at all. Like you can be very very stoic and and male. You know, like you can be very very assertive and all that type of stuff. But you have to have an ability to process this stuff. And Jung would suggest that men who haven't integrated their anima are actually less masculine because oftentimes mm. this energy, this animating energy, these problems, they get shoved somewhere else and it makes them sort of insecure and it makes them very, very, very actually easily triggered. Whereas a man who knows that he can handle almost any emotion, no matter how devastating, he knows that he can process it. He's actually going to be quite fearless because most of the things you're afraid of are not reality. You're actually afraid of emotions. Mm. Like if you think about your people, like you're actually afraid of embarrassment. You're not afraid of people. You're afraid of like the only thing you're really afraid of is literal pain, literal getting punched and all that. And and even in some sense, that's even wrapped up with a fear of 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 getting humiliated. Like, you know, people you say, I'm afraid of uh, getting killed in public, like a, a public execution is very, very scary for people, often because it's like, oh, my God, I'll be exposed and people will see me in my worst moments. And it's like, yeah, that that's it's all wrapped up into this. It's, it's feelings that, that people are terrified. And I, this is, I think this is why um, old Big J, old Jesus Christ, has such a captivating power over our hearts because mm. he seems like someone who just faced the absolute worst emotions. Oh, yeah. Like utter, unredemptive humiliation. Like Going absolutely to, just... Storming into hell and just get the fuck behind me, yeah. demon. Like just, but feeling it all, but really just grounded in his powers. Yeah, it's super... It's funny that you mentioned yeah. old J because I've been getting real deep into Christianity lately, so... Oh dear, we're yeah. going to have... It's deep, man, have, it's deep. <laughs> we're going to have a, a, an Aussie revival, is that what's going to happen? We're going to have the... <laughs> we'll, um, see, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I'd, just so, before, in, so, sorry to cut you, but just before you continue, because you touched on the anima, and this is something that, uh, you know, I got getting into NoFap and all that kind of stuff. How do you, for people listening at home, how do you develop this anima so that you don't become too overly feminized and too overly sensitive, but still feel This is... This is 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 pretty. Ugh, it's. I'm. I'm not too strong on this one because I. I think. Um. I talked about Jung earlier, and in terms of strong concepts, he has mm -hmm. shadow, introvert, extrovert, and loose ones. I think anima, animus. Oof. It very, very. He's like painting a very, very loose category over some of his experiences. Okay. Um. Synchronicity is another one. You know, like it's, it's kind of a hard one for a lot of people, and I. I. I don't like. Um. I don't like prattling on about stuff that I'm not too sure of. So my understanding of the anima, and this is really my take, by the way, like a lot of what you just got here was my take. This is my spin on this type of stuff. And um, my, my spin on the anima would be, um, as I said, first of all, the dreams animate you. Now, that's an important thing. The right brain, it has this power mm. to animate your life, to fill your life with meaning. Now, it's actually very similar to what Jung talked about. Jung, you could look at the anima the same way as the Greeks understood the muse, the ancient muse. And um, you know that concept where the poet would, would sit down and the muse would come. It's where yeah. we get the word music from. Yeah. And it would inspire him. All right. In Ireland, we had Bridget, the muse of inspiration. And these are very, very important concepts. And it's almost like this part of your mind, Narnia, is represented archetypically as a feminine force. Maybe the right brain is archetypally represented to us as a feminine force. And in some sense, you think about what needs to happen. Well, you need to get rid of your stiff male right, left brain approach of linear logic. And you actually need to open, literally open yourself. And that's a very feminine thing to do. Open yourself up to getting filled with some other energy from some other place. Like that's a very, very feminine thing. That's literally like the act of sex from the feminine perspective. Oh, yeah. And so in some sense, inside your mind, that's what a man needs to do. He needs to allow himself to get populated, get, get you know, filled, get energized by the right brain, by something that's not his ego. That's something that's not himself. Yeah. Okay. 
So the the sort of the, the 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 Narnia is opening the door into that bubble, which is your ego, your male space, your safe space, your manosphere, you know. And then all this 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 magic energy, this this <laughs> whatever you want to say, like just squirts in and <laughs> and populates your ego with this new life. Literally, like that's that's sort yeah, of no, yeah. a, a kind of crude way to describe it. And you kind of think about that, and you're like, oh my Jesus Christ, young, what the hell, man? Are you, <laughs> are you trying to turn me trying to turn me gay or something like that? Like what's going on? But I guess this is what it is. And 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 poets and and you know. All, all this type of thing they need to have that ability to do this type of stuff they need to be able to allow something else to, to do it and you talk to any artist i've felt mm. this too it doesn't feel like you're making art it feels like you're letting something talk through you oh 100 you know yeah 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 definitely yeah, yeah if, actually the the, but, hermetists, the hermetists have a diff, uh, interesting approach on masculine and femininity they describe basically masculinity is the the seed of creation and the femininity generates that reality and it just feeds together in that way but yeah, it just reminded me of what you said. Yeah. Sorry, go yeah. on. No, 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 absolutely. And like, I, I think that's, that's um, the hermeticists are actually pretty cool stuff to, to, to oscillate al alongside this stuff, especially if you, if you ground a lot of this stuff in science. Yeah. As I said, the left brain and right brain, if you could gender those two brains, yeah, you do kind of get this approach of like the, the right brain is sort of like some type of feminine force that you have to, or maybe maybe you have to effeminize the left brain or something like that. It's a very confusing thing. Like, what do you do? do you, maybe do you turn the left brain from being a stiff man who's in control and you actually make the left brain understand that you're actually a little bitch that has to, well, okay, that's crude, but you're like, you know, <laughs> nah, you're the, you're, I, you're, you're, <laughs> you must submit. You must submit the yeah. will of the right brain and the right brain's the real man around here. Whereas yeah. I guess you could say the uninitiated sees the left brain, the ego as the man, the controller, the, the leader. And the right brain is all this this world of feminine feelings of no right. consequence. Keeping Whereas if you can way, invert that and right. make yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if you can invert that a little bit and make the, the left brain understand that it's actually submissive, it's actually the servant, it's actually the, the feminine wife to mm -hmm. this powerful, imaginative, conscious right brain, like a sort of ma magic wizard or something like that is actually the leader. And he just doesn't, he's an introverted, leading, imaginative, uh, powerful man, energy, maybe, uh, or something like that. Like th these are kind of cool ways you can play with this type of stuff. And, and this is sort of what I'd encourage people to do is, is, is look at this stuff and try play with it and try to understand it and try map what Jung is saying on top of it. I, I feel a lot of what goes wrong with this is that, um, the anima turns into get in touch with your feminine side. And that turns actually into um, a very, very poor way of relating with people's emotions. And extremely, this is probably one of the most negative things I see in most people is uh, the conception that um, su submissive attitudes towards your own feelings, the emasculization of your feelings is is ideally correct. That's getting in touch with your feminine. So for example, a man gets angry because people push push him around and he's always self-sacrificing and all that type of stuff and and he, he justifies it in his mind because it's getting in touch with the feminine it's it may be christian often you hear that as well or it's just good and right and all right. this type of stuff and this is actually like very destructive because on some level your emotions your animating emotions your anima itself perhaps they're not there to, to – they're not demons. They're actually there for a reason. You're, ang you're getting angry because people are pushing you around. You should start to assert yourself. You mm. should start to draw lines in the sand. Yeah. You should start to push back, these type of things. And that's often the case. And, and that's um, a very, very important thing to keep in mind. So, so again, this is why it's a little bit of a dangerous one. Um, now, then in terms of stuff like NOFAP and addictions and all this, there, must, there might be some type of idea that – if you're not animated from within, so if you don't have the, the right brain filling you full of juice and so you're waking up every day and it's like, I'm going to make 20 YouTube videos today and then I'm going to write 40, 40 articles and I'm going to run around and I'm going to talk to a million girls and then I'm going to like make make food out of just clapping my hands and all this. You're not filled, <laughs> you're not filled yeah. full of the zest for life. And if you're empty, remember with the depression thing, if you've locked everything away, if you stuffed the shadow and the anima back in Narnia and you're empty, well, you're going to want to be filled. You're actually this, this left brain. It's still still a girl that craves to be filled with juice, let's <laughs> put it bluntly. And so what you're going to do is yeah. you're going to instead of drawing energy from within, instead of drawing animating power from within, you're going to draw animating power from without. So you're going to go and you're going to go to Pornhub, and you're going to look at all these people um, getting primal, and you're going to draw energy from that. And it's going to make you feel excited. Mm. 
and they'll go away. And then you feel depressed again because you're going back to your normal state. Mm. You're in a dead state, your left brain state. And so the left brain with its dopamine receptors will be like, something else, do something else, do some food. Okay, you eat the food, you feed the, eat the food, eat the food, and you feel animated because you're full of food. And then that goes away. And then you're like, okay, um, okay, back to Pornhub or, or YouTube. I'll watch more YouTube videos. I'll fill myself full of more knowledge. That's what will fix me. More knowledge from outside, no knowledge from inside. And again, you're starting to try get animated from the outside world. And you could think of this, and, and this is almost always paired with this very, very interesting personality, the Reddit personality, where um, you're – understanding of yourself as someone who takes in knowledge so you get injected with all this but you see yourself as a very manly character who 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 discriminates among the knowledge and judges the knowledge so you watch all these youtube videos and you you are the 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 critic you know that type of character and so you're sort of like oh that's a very very bad idea you put there at minute 42.3 person on youtube yeah. i'm going to write a 20 20 page long comment to explain to you why you're such an idiot and <laughs> then i'm going to do all this type of stuff and of course it's it's some type of in, in insane perspective inside your head where you're, you're like this impotent left brain with no original animated ideas mm. and all you can do is sit around and, and bicker and rationalize like a woman like the negative view we have of a woman you can all you can do is sit and bicker and rationalize at all this stuff that you're consuming so you're just getting filled by all this stuff from the outside world and all you can do is just just be like oh you're not good enough oh i hate you oh i'm so mad oh you're so disgusting you're so pathetic i'm supreme i know what's going on maybe this could be anima possession, as Jung understood it, you know? Mm. Maybe this could be why P these guys, they get attracted to, you know, f people with the same bad energy. So again, and that type of thing, like depressed energy usually attracts depressed energy. And so you hang around people who get your vibe. And then you all sit around, you're all these critics about the world or on Reddit or something like that. And then there's this big, this big conglomerate. It's like the group forms this like gravitas to it and it, it's very heavy and dark and that cynical critical attitude and all that Maybe that's anima possession. M maybe it is. It's, it's a very very loose concept very very difficult one But it's a it's a, a kind of cool way to clash it up against what we what, what what I believe we know about the brain so far Very interesting take man. Yeah, definitely and you hit the nail on the head when you I think you should get your power within, you know what I mean? People constantly always look, and I'm, I'm guilty of this, man. I have a very addictive personality and I've got to constantly, you know, work on that part. I'm of the it. same, dude. So it's just I'm how the same. it is. My, my, le my left brain can talk about this as much as I want, but I've, I've still, I still have addictive personality shit, like so annoying. Wish, yeah. I wish I could talk about it till it fixed me, but it doesn't, so. <laughs> and with uh, shadow integration, so obviously, you know, this is a quote that I've used for many years. Well, I stole it from Carl Jung. Beware of unearned wisdom. And he was regarding psychedelics, <laughs> opening the doors <laughs> too much. So outside of psychedelics, is there a approach to shadow integration where it can be too dangerous or you, maybe you're moving too quick where it can have a similar effect of that opening too much? You know what I mean? Yeah, or well... I, I kind I kind of skip steps a bit, like um, and I believe Jung recommended this as well. I remember Jimmy saying that th this is uh this is the way it should be done. Um, you like the 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 main and even the science as I understand it, the main thing I think most people should do is focusing on switching on the the bridge between the left brain and the right brain. And for example, a method like learning how to explore your emotions in that sort of associative way is, is is actually one really simple method. And there's a litany of different others. When someone sits down with this urge to write a story or a play, like that's that, that's that part of themselves switching into gear. Mm. And and that's it. And it's it's like it, it's it's this part of themselves just demanding that this happens now. Like I need like I need to process something complex. And so this is what's going on. And so um in terms of uh something like shadow integration, like in some sense the, the the right brain is the processor, is the integrator. Mm. And all you really need to do is build a relationship with that. So you can maybe you can maybe look at that as like integrating the anima, skipping the step or something like that. Maybe you don't need to spend years facing the shadows, although I think the shadow is almost always what you're going to come across first. So if you're going to sit in there and you're kind of thinking to yourself, what the fuck do I do? Well, you know, if you're possessed by some big heavy negative energy, as most people are today, sit down there and say to yourself, could I process this negative energy from a sort of right brain perspective? And I think that would be the most down to earth, reasonable way to do it. Now, of course, you can try this cool stuff like dreams. Dreams are the, 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 the associative mind par excellence in its, in its form. It's really, really good at this type of thinking. And so switch into that as well. 
And um, yeah, I'd recommend you try all that. I, I like. I think it is actually quite simple. Mm. I, well, for myself, I find that just even expressing myself through art, whether it's music, filmmaking, whatever, that definitely helps a lot because it gets that stuff out of your soul. You know what I mean? Instead of just suppressing yeah. it. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot Brother, of people. If, pardon? Go ahead. Give me, give me one second. There's someone at the door. I'll bounce. I'll be back in a sec. Go for it. How, how are you, brother? Yeah, I'm good. You know, just chilling. Hello. How are you doing? Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, rocking around, running around in a panic. Um, sorry about that, sir. No, um, no, thank okay. you. All good, man. So where were we? What, where, where should we pick so up? We'll what talk, was going on? All right. So we're talking about animus, but uh, shadow integration and how if, if there's any dangerous ways, if, if you can, you know, like oh, is it, dangerous, yeah, dangerous ways of shadow um, integration. Because I, I was actually watching, a, you know, your mate Jimmy talking about how the shadow in its totality is almost like too much. Like we can't expect to integrate the whole shadow, you know what I mean? Like the whole world. Like, is it a case of just chasing your tail or is there an actual place where you can integrate your entire your whole shadow yeah nietzsche has a very interesting quote where he says um i measure the spirit of a man by how much truth he can digest and that's a pretty fucking intense one when you combine it with that idea i'm wow i'm I'm not too i'm not too sure yeah, it's a scary one. I'm, I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure if there's a, a dangerous way you can go about it. Like, I assume if you kind of sit down with yourself and say, I'm going to take on all the sins of the world, you're going to have to take on equal amounts of responsibility. You're going to have to, you're probably going to have to hit Christ level. And what happens with Christ? Well, of course, he, you can imagine Christ as someone says, right, I'll take, I'll take all the shadow. All right, I'll like, go on, give, give me the shadow there, lads. And so he takes the entirety of the shadow on his shoulders. And what happens is it kills him. It, it actually just destroys him. It murders him, mm. literally. Yeah. You know, and and that's that's how heavy it would be. And you, you think about it, it's like the world's a dark place. And if you like, there's a lot of really heavy dark energy, and there's some very very savage stuff. And I think if you were to become conscious of the nature of the world, you have to face some really really brutal things and really really debilitating things. Like a, a great example, I love to shove in people's face, which is a very very difficult thing to digest. Is that no matter how good you think you are. No matter what your morality is about right and wrong, in order for you to eat, you have to murder animals. And actually, to the extent that we do this, Mm -hmm. we have giant steel factories where we murder millions and millions and millions and millions of animals every month. Mm -hmm. And that's that that's 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 like pulling the skirt up on the nature of our society, you know, the nature of, of life even in that it's not a nice thing where everybody comes out a winner it's actually my my vitality is at the expense of these other beings and the only reason that i allow myself to do that is because i've got a conception in my mind that these beings are lower than me Mm. they're beneath me and so that's just one example you can actually kind of sit with that and what happens is when most people see that they go vegan you know it makes them change their life and that actually breaks their heart yeah. They're like, oh my God. I, I did that vegan. At, at one stage. I did that for a couple of years. So did I. So did I. <laughs> but my body and, and started this, breaking this down. So but anyways, that's another story. And, but but this is the thing. This is this is the really scary thing is that I go vegan. I face that shadow. I, so I see mm-hmm. the nature of the world. And emotionally, I'm like, I don't want this to happen. So I want to do something about this. So I start to integrate my shadow and I fight the, the the terror, what's happening to the animals. I will not participate. Mm-hmm. And then my body starts to fail. And so now I'm going to start to face another shadow. This is a harder shadow. Mm-hmm. Is that the nature of life is not such that the non-meat eater can thrive. It's actually that the meat eater thrives. The bad guy wins in some sense. Mm-hmm. Showing that the conception of good and bad in my mind was not correct. Which is scary. Because yeah. then it's like something like the animals getting hurt is not nature doesn't care just like she doesn't care about the gazelle that gets eaten by the lion so now you're starting to get into the scary stuff and um that's hard for a lot of people although i I don't know what that means i don't know how you can like if you tell someone like that will it just devastate them and break them and all that i don't know i I don't really know what you can do with that i see i see people buckle from this often I, i i see this i see sort of nietzsche as an example of someone who points out these things and people just can't take them. They're just like, I don't want, 
he's a he's evil. He's a bad person. He's got all these things wrong with him and all this. He can't he can't tell me this stuff. He can't pull the rug up and all that. Maybe most people aren't supposed to read yeah. Nietzsche. Maybe most people are supposed to just uh, ignore the heavy shadows that he points out and just kind of move on with their lives or something. Reading it's, Nietzsche it's very is, like having a, is like having a bad psychedelic trip. It's just too much. You just can't handle it. <laughs> For a lot of well, people, yeah, this for a is lot it. of people, yeah. yeah well, it's, it's a weird one, all right. Like, but, um, go on, go on. Uh, if, just to go back on the veganism thing, you know, some people would say like, oh, yeah, but that's because you just, you didn't do veganism right, right? Because there are people who are fundamental in their belief that think that the all human beings on planet Earth are actually originally designed to be vegan, which of course, I don't personally believe that. And I've seen different results from different people and not to make this about veganism, but it's an important note because <laughs> I really, really, really tried to do it, man. And when I went three years, three and a half years without red meat. And then when I finally had my, cause I was going pale, I was going skinny. I was breaking down, I was getting overly sensitive, anxiety, depression. And then I had my first grass fed burger and I'm telling you, man, I had a full, bo like full body orgasm, like a soul orgasm. <laughs> to, you know what I mean? That sounds horrible, right? To a, like, especially to a to a hardcore vegan. But yeah, it's just fun. It's well, it's not funny, ha ha, funny, but <laughs> it's pretty funny actually. But sometimes well, we have to do horrible shit, you know? Yeah, and and this is um, this is uh, I, I went through the same thing. I was I went very very weak, and uh, one day I just said, "All right, fuck this," and I went to the local butcher and bought a load of mints and just ate that. And literally, I could I literally lay down afterwards and could feel my my body healing. Mm. You know, I could feel my body re-energizing. Okay, and at that point, that was the point where my my physiology dominated my philosophy absolutely, and yeah. made me understand that. I was not, it was not correct. And I, I've talked to vegans about this. And actually, the only consistent response to this is that most vegans say it's not about health for me. It's about philosophy. Yeah, I, I believe intellectually that it's wrong to kill animals. And I'm willing to sacrifice myself to do that. Now, they're someone who's philosophically consistent. But of course, if we were to, but then aren't they we putting dictate, animals above themselves, in a sense, like it seems yeah, like a quality, but really, yeah. they're actually lowering themselves to an animal. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're, I'm not, they're, I'm not they're saying not... it's a bad thing necessarily, but it's just something well, that it's, I've noticed, you know? It's just, it's very, very complicated. And, and basically what they're deciding is that the world is evil. So they yeah. come in contact with the shadow of the world mm -hmm. and they're, they're, they struggle to digest it. And I fucking get it, man. Yeah. It's not nice watching an animal get murdered and it's then brutal. eating that every day. It's not nice. It's not nice to become aware of that. And so they become conscious of this. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they see the shadow. And they decide, they feel emotionally that I would rather die. I would rather leave this earth than contribute to any more of that. Mm. And that's a very, very serious philosophical position, but it's philosophically consistent. It's saying, I am going to sacrifice myself. I don't want to participate in this shit show. Now, Nietzsche would indicate that as a philosophy of nihilism. Yep. You react to life with disgust mm -hmm. and you choose to essentially like sacrifice yourself um but this is perhaps an example of someone who faces the shadow and like i don't wish to be offensive to them because it's a very very serious thing but it's too much it's too much to take in it's too much for them to sit down and philosophically see in experience that animals dying is necessary towards your vitality because that says a lot about that says a lot about human relations as well, because if animals and their pain doesn't matter, there's no reason to assume that human pain matters much more because mm. we're just animals as well. This is where things start getting very scary. But this is if you're going to be philosophically consistent. And then this is, of course, the shadow thing. And this is where it becomes way too intense for a lot of people. And yeah. this is sort of what I mean. This is you and can, you can take yeah. too much on. And people can go. I, I think our time zone differences. So we're like we're really delayed. So sorry, folks, if I'm. Sound like I'm like you know I sound rude. I'm just cutting out. No, no, you're all right. You're all right. Uh, but uh, yeah, even with the you know some people go real extreme in their position, and but I think with the meat eater, I think at the start, if you're unconscious about it and you don't even want to look at like what's really going on, and you're just blindly buying meat from whatever, I think that's very different to at least knowing what you're doing, knowing what you're contributing to, and actually sitting yeah. with that feeling. And that's what I do now. Yeah, I I think um. 
in terms of like how I rationalize this, so I guess like if you want to keep this relevant to what we're talking about, uh, this was a very big shadow experience for me. It was a very, very dark reality. Yeah. And it is. There's no way around this. Like this is not, as you said, if you think that you can just pretend that animals aren't real or that it doesn't like this isn't something you or vegans are just idiots, you're not facing the truth. And yeah. therefore you lose the moral claim to the truth yeah. altogether. You're not a good person, nor are you a truthful person. You're someone who wants to live in rational dissonance, which is fine. Like everybody does it. I do it too. But but that's you just sort of have to be aware of that. And so I faced this stuff and I, and it was too much. It made me turn vegan. I was like, I can't do it. I can't handle this. This I can't be part of this. My body breaks down. And so eventually I my philosophy gets destroyed by my body. My body says this is not right. Mm. And so I it's it's almost this awakening moment where it's like everything that I thought about the nature of the world is wrong. The world can't run on insane empathy, like insanely um, forward empathy, or or maybe that's wrong. It should be maybe sympathy or something like that. Um, mm. Things are things are going to have to suffer for me to thrive, which is so scary. It's so scary. The the the, the cow is going to have to lose 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 its life for my health. That's yeah. the way it works, and that's actually very very consistent with what, with what we observe in nature. Now, not all animals are like this, but lions eat gazelles, and lions are beautiful, thriving animals. Mm. They're the apex predator. Exactly. And when you, when, you digest, when you digest this, you're like, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Yeah, this seems to be the legit... This seems to be the legit way that things work. This is actually sort of Nietzsche's idea, the naturalistic philosophy, the way nature. Why don't we discipline our morality, our way of seeing the world to nature, as opposed to all this bullshit we tell ourselves inside our left brains? Very, very actually simple thing. Then, of course, when I'm trying to work through this, this is a very, very hard thing for me to understand, because does that mean I can just be mean to everyone and hurt people? But, of course, what you start to see is that nature is not necessarily unnecessarily cruel. She's very rarely unnecessarily cruel. She doesn't, like, she doesn't often do that. She, the, the lion doesn't catch the gazelle and like string it up and cut its guts out and fuck with it and all this. It doesn't, de it doesn't like, you know, it doesn't disrespect it and all that. It I, tends I to be kind of a... I think chimpanzees are pretty mean. <laughs> fuck. Oh, no. I, I've heard well, of, uh, I guess... I was watching Joe Rogan. He said there was a video of like this chimpanzee like like just basically holding another chimpanzee and digging his nail into his back, just like torturing him pretty much. But yeah, chimpanzees, they're, they're related deep, to them. Yeah, exactly. It actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, can, the kangaroo will cleanse the earth, man. The kangaroo will right. cleanse Can, the earth. Kangaroos aren't nice, man. <laughs> I know that everyone <laughs> around the world looks like, oh, kangaroos. Aussies, like, we eat kangaroos, actually. So it's not that big. Of course of a deal. you do. Of course we do. Yeah. You're my bastard. <laughs> You're my bastard. Um, so, so. The sort of way I, I started to process this was um, I started to look at it from a naturalistic perspective. So I mm. disciplined my mind to these first principles yeah. and it completely shifted the way I see everything. And I, st I started to get this incredible bullshit intolerance. Like I, I like someone just rationalizing to me, reminded me of what I was like as a vegan. And I just sort of was I just got turned off. I was like, this is crap. Like they don't know what they're talking about. They're just, they're just prattering along their left brain, giving me some philosophy for the fact that they haven't faced these very, very hard problems. And so what I started to see was the naturalistic perspective, like what is closest to God's garden, which is nature. Mm. And then you start to see really interesting things because you get this new discipline mindset. You start to see really, really interesting solutions to this problem. For example, you watch an African tribesman um, hunt uh, a deer to exhaustion. Sounds intense. But of course, when he catches them, he sits down with them and he, he pets him. The deer gives up and he pets him and he, he says a prayer with him before he takes his life. And it's actually an incredibly beautiful thing because it's ritualizing it. And now I, I, you start to see where things like animal sacrifice come from mm. because these people, these ancient people, the pagans of Europe, they struggled just like I did with this feeling. Why do I get to murder animals? And there would have been all this bad juju in it. It's like if I murder the animals, will that mean that the, 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 the karma of the world will come back and, and hurt me? So in order for me to justify murdering the animal, do I have to actually uh, give something to the karma of the world, God, the gods, you mm. know? It's actually a very, very logical old, thing. Very Old Testament. 
Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So it's a very, very logical and straightforward thing. You sit down mm-hmm. and when you're going to kill the animal, you give it reverence. Yeah. You, you spend time with it and you say to it, I'm taking your life and I'm going to give this energy as thanks to the Lord for allowing this to happen to me mm-hmm. and that type of favor. And it's it's sacred and that and that brings it into it. And that it's you can even say it's the right brain coming in and animating reality. And that actually redeems the act in an incredible way, psychologically as well. Mm. And it makes it make sense for us. Now, you think about how we do it in our in our deadened, unsacred um, world. What we do is we stuff all the animals in these huge, huge, big uh, compartments and they get processed in silent hidden away meat factories. So none of us ever have to see the reality of what goes on. We have no contact point with the actual world. We never have to face our shadow. We're, we're coddled and we're protected. And it's humane. Right. So what they do is they stick them in these these little tunnels that are designed to keep the cow calm as it walks towards death. Now think, this is humane. Compare this, for example, to the, the animal that literally knows it sees this fucking crazy African tribesman with the big spear chasing it down for miles and miles and miles. Its last four hours are just pure terror in its mind, right? Because it knows it's getting hunted and it actually has to submit its will to this man. Mm. Whereas with this, the cow doesn't know to the last moment that it's going to get killed. Mm. And it, it does actually seem more humane. But of course, when you look at it, it seems horrific it seems like uh, a scene from the matrix where you know body comes in head cut off mm. flip it over machine goes out. it's very crude it's very ugly it's very unsacred it's very sterile it's very Hel- hellish lifeless. In, in a sense well definitely for the animals right hellish that, in exactly that, in that situation yeah it, it ab- and, and the sheer scale of it is actually what's even more frightening is because mm. there's just so much death it's so mechani- mechanized and industrialized. And it looks literally like the left Dude, brain personified. We even change our language as well. We don't even call it cow. We call it beef. You know what I mean? Like we change, yeah. we change or we have it in a nice little package or, you know, and then you'll ask yeah, you'll, most meat pe- you If you ask most meat eaters, would you kill an animal yourself? The vast majority will say, no, I couldn't do that. And that's exactly it. That's exactly that's the what you start part. to get into. Yeah. That's that's exactly where you start asking real questions. Mm. It's like maybe maybe it's that it's not that um the the vegans are necessarily wrong. It's that the meat eaters are are, are implicitly naive. And I yeah. get why because it for you to accept this shadow, you're probably going to turn to a vegan before you get to this perspective. Yeah, like you're going to start at vegan, and maybe that's you you don't have the the the, the courage, the strength to digest this truth. So maybe the shadow's too heavy for you. I, I don't know. Like, it's a very, very hard question. What's psychologically correct in order to deal with this? But of course, this is a difficult problem because your naivety, your inability to digest the shadow is at the expense of thousands and thousands of animals' lives throughout your life. Mm. And that doesn't, that means you're not a good person. No matter what you tell me, you're not, you know, you're a piece and of you shit. think about what this means. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's um, not, not necessarily like you are a piece of shit, but I know you're only joking, but yeah. it's more like um, it's actually very, very ugly mentally to for me. I, I actually get visceral reactions off this when people rationalize stuff like this. I, I would rather someone come up to me and be like, I eat animals because I, I care about myself more than I do about the animals. I actually find that more transparent and authentic than someone who sort of like gives me a story about why it's okay. It's not okay. Like it's it's intense as shit. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like it's really hardcore. And even the way we do it, as I said, it's desacralized. That's I think the worst. That's really, I guess this is what I sort of noticed about it. Our rationalizations are exactly what desacralize. It's almost like the left brain when it needs its explanation, strips the 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 procedure of all its 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 magic and turns it into this horrible, dead mechanical factory that shows up in these little square compartmentalized plastics that is very, very wasteful that comes like, you know, like the 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 beef in Brazil ends up in the shelves in Ireland. Like it's just so nonsensical. It's so intense. These people, you think about how much food we throw out. We buy this this meat and it's no consequence to us. And it's like low quality meat and we just throw throw it on and we eat 50% of it and throw it away. Mm. And you think about that, that was, that was an animal's body. And we have the arrogance to throw that out coarsely because animals don't matter because they're not real and all that. And you think about how desacralized, now compare that to the, to the, the, the pagan who kills the animal and that fucking pagan's going to eat every part of that animal, oh, every yeah. part, you know? 
No, for survival reasons, of course, but also from this idea that imagine if you don't and you, you're you're trivial with this animal's body, Zeus might come down and fuck you up. You don't want to you don't want to sacrifice something to Zeus and then treat it with lack of value. You know what I mean? Mm. And that becomes extremely interesting. So it seems that. In the face of trauma, if you psychologically process it correctly, you actually do something quite noble. But of course, it's very, very hard to get to that point because it's hard to digest some of these problems. And you see it exactly in that meat stuff. You see it exactly in that vegan stuff. People struggle. They turn vegan. They turn literally into nihilists. And I mean nihilists in the sense of like death is better than life. And that's a that's a real nihilism. And that's a real interesting philosophical position. It's better to die than it is to participate in life because life is evil. That's literally what they believe. And that's fine. You know, it, it's 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 sort of logically coherent in a way. But um, this is the kind of next though. level beyond it. <laughs> yeah. Definitely not practical, no. Definitely not practical. See, this is the next level beyond it then. This is about re-sacralizing the world, mm. bringing back in um, animated energy and understanding that, that our relationship with animals is it, like probably, in my opinion, the biggest problem is the psychological relationship to it, the trivialness. We treat these type of things. You start to understand then a lot about what shadow work is. The problem for most naive children is that they're not aware of how dangerous the world is. This is why trauma shocks them. And so what you need to do as a tribe, this is what they used to do, is they used to initiate people. How do you initiate them? You make them face the shadow. And it's almost always too much for them. That's the purpose, right? So what you do in an initiation is you drag a young boy out of his, his mom's arms and you beat the fuck out of him while you're dressed as the gods that you've told him his whole life are going to come and kill him if he's not good. And at that moment, he faces the fear of death. He faces the reality that I'm about to get murdered. And he cries and he, he throws a tantrum. And he gets traumatized. What do you do? You actually traumatize him purposefully. Mm. And you keep pushing him until he stands up and he faces you. And he, he, he displays courage inside of himself, the courage to face the, 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 the fear, the, 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 the gods, the danger, the violence of life. And that's when you slap the gods mask on top of him and say, you are now a god. You have now transcended your all too human form and you've been initiated. And in some sense, this teaches him the, the meaning of all these these sacred things, like why trauma is important. He, he moves from being naive to being a member of the tribe. He moves to being a member of the gang. And this is a very, very important thing. This is almost like ancient shadow integration. And if I was to say anything, I think this is what I notice in this is that we we just don't have the conception that we need to do this stuff because we're afraid of hurting people's feelings. We're afraid of traumatizing. We think trauma is a bad thing. Trauma is the most necessary thing in your life. It's going to happen at some point. And in some sense, if you think about it, like our, our refusal to traumatize humans is costing animals this horrific almost like sadistic surgical existence where they're all mm. stuffed into boxes and then like cut into pieces and all that you can imagine maybe a ritual forming and um, counter to veganism where you take every young person who wants to eat meat and you make them kill their own animal at some point it's like you know a thing you do in school where they go to a farm and they have to take the life and they have to kind of stand around and understand what's going on and everybody has to stand around. All the city folk they have to stand around. And that's what they do. And it's like, this is where your meat comes from. Feel its, feel its pulse. Feel that animal's pulse. Mm. Look it in the eyes. Look see, it in the eyes. See the light disappear from its eyes. You know? Watch it. Watch it rither. Watch all, watch all that stuff. And know what you're doing. You know? You can eat the meat if you want. I just want you to know. And we won't. We would never let that happen. Because we would say, no, that's too much for a kid to go through. Maybe that is our problem who knows holy shit exactly i even think this is why it, well for myself visiting third world countries is very important to at least see yeah. you know uh. reality <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. so and maybe yeah. that's, that's an aspect of sh facing the shadow because it can be traumatizing and I, I don't mean going to third world country touristically i mean hanging out with an <laughs> actual local you know like in the slums or something yeah. like that it can be very yeah, yeah, very beneficial, you know, just to give you perspective. And then when you go back home to your Western country, I'm assuming people listening to it mostly from Western countries, is that you start to have a whole new perspective on it. You start to have gratitude and you can't, yeah, just more bigger perspective. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. 
Absolutely. And it's, it's so interesting that if you ground your philosophies in these experiences, they tend to be a lot more coherent. You know, they tend to form into things that just are far more intelligent, but tend to be more complex. Whereas if you develop a philosophy absent of actual experience, it almost always turns into some type of naive, weird, sometimes even nihilistic death perspective. Um, like the vegan could be the example that that's someone coming in contact with the shadow of modern society and they don't have the philosophy because society hasn't given it to them to match their mm -hmm. philosophy is this sort of empathy is good everything else is bad and and this actually destroys them it actually they're not able to, to cope with it and so you've got this really really interesting problem it's like how do, do you red pill everyone on the on the animal question or would you break half the society you know, so what is it do you do? How do you how do you make people more capable of doing this type of stuff? And and the reality is, is that like the shadow, you, you ha like this stuff, this stuff is there. You have to acknowledge that it's it's not it, it, you can't you can't just pretend it's not there. Mm. Like it is there. And, and you're in denial as long as you don't. So it's a very, very hard problem for a lot of people. It's very, very it's like, how what do we do about that? I don't know, man. I really don't know. <laughs> yeah, man, I know it's. Uh, I'm just realizing the time. How, do you have much time left, or? Oh yeah, I wouldn't mind wrapping it up soon enough if we yeah, could. Yeah, we'll do that. that. Yeah, yeah. That's all good, man. I think because you know, opening up the Christianity rabbit hole is a whole different thing, isn't it? Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> well, if you're keen to do this oh, again, dear. man, I'll be. I'll, man, this this conversation is what I'm all about, man. And I think it's like kind of the heart Beautiful. heart of my channel in many ways. So. Beautiful, brother. Yeah, man. I really appreciate you coming on. I've, my mind has been blown and I've, i have a lot to think about and i think you have a very unique authentic approach to jung and like you said you're not just memorizing shit you know google definitions you're like really delving <laughs> into this stuff and I, yeah i think it's very refreshing thank you very much brother that's the the pinnacle compliment you could say my my uh, juicy right brain is flattered immensely <laughs> and uh, incredible thank you very much sir and um, thank you very much for reaching out thank you for taking the effort and time to reach out and uh yeah, like uh, who, the boyos watching as well. Like uh, you find me over on Uber Boyo on YouTube. And give a couple of videos a watch, and this is really good, man. I really enjoyed this as well. I'm gonna try stick this up on. Uh, I'll see if I can put it on the the old podcast playlist and get a couple of people to watch it as well. So, yeah. um, thank you very much. Beautiful, man. Yeah, definitely have to keep in touch, and yeah, I think we've just kind of scratched the surface on this, and but I think we've given people a pretty basic understanding on at least the the popular Jung concepts without going too woo woo, you know. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll leave your links below. Like, so just your YouTube channel. Where else do you, do you want to plug anything else uh, where people oof. can reach you? Oh, what else? What else could I plug? Um, I'm over. Well, I've got uberboyo.com if you want to run over there and check it out. And um, the YouTube channel would be great too. And sure, I'm also on Spotify if you want to check that out. I've got some music up if you want to listen to me lilt. You can most certainly can find me over there. Awesome, brother. Yeah, really appreciate you coming right. on, man, and taking the time. So yeah, man. I'll catch you soon. Have a good one. Beautiful, brother. Cheers for watching, guys. Hope you enjoyed this mind-bending podcast and definitely gave me a lot to think about. So, yeah, if you enjoyed it, make sure to leave a like, share it around, go on iTunes, Spotify, leave us a review. And if you want to support this podcast, you can go to Patreon or get some merch. Just check the links in the description box below. And I'd also love to give a shout out to my mate, Jason Stevenson, who does guided meditations. Uh, I think meditation is a very useful practice, especially going into these sorts of realms, you know, just to kind of calm and center the mind. So yeah, check it out. Links in the description. Catch you guys next time. Peace.